Howdy folks, I'm Ross Weaver. Welcome back to my Metal Gear Solid V Explained lecture series. This will be lecture number 14 in the series. I'm going to go over missions 28, Code Talker, and mission 29, Metallic Archaea. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about this timeline stuff that I kind of mentioned last episode, last lecture. Because, uh, well, we finally get a good sort of waypoint as to when this might be happening and excuse me by kind of lining up this one point with another thing that we can pretty much tell without having to do this much complicated stuff it gives us kind of two points from which we can get a line going and from that line we can kind of tell uh, how long all this stuff that's happening in Afghanistan in the 90s that uh, Venom Snake's doing how long it happens and, and what what's about to happen and you know kind of explain some of the narrative that's about to come up here in a minute and also will just help retroactively explain some uh, some of the other stuff in the past that's in between all of this so um <clears throat> in mission 28 and code talker we've got back in tw back in 27 we picked up the intel agent he told us his name code talker and we've heard he's this Parasitologist, the guy who knows the, the secrets behind our uh, linguistic parasite that's in, you know infecting everybody on our base, and he's going to be the guy that we need to get to cure it. So he's out deep in the jungles. Um, he's actually across the Angola Zaire border in the Zaire region, and uh, Zaire is also known as the Congo uh, in other times in, in in the past. So we're going into the jungles of the Congo, essentially the Congo jungles. Uh, which is like kind of tied in with, uh, I want to say, I think it was Heart of Darkness that's set there. Or in a very similar place. I'm pretty sure it's set there with uh, Colonel Kurtz. And so it's kind of like, Co Code Talker's kind of like Colonel Kurtz. We got to go get this crazy guy in the jungle. Although he's not really the crazy guy. He's like the scientist working for the crazy guy. You could think of him maybe more like that way. And, and, and Big Boss is the Colonel Kurtz in this situation, really. Uh, he's the he's the crazy one who's been driven mad by the jungle <laughs> and needs to be brought in. So, we gotta go get Code Talker. And on the way there, we get ambushed by four skull snipers, the females. They are extremely dangerous and deadly. And you can sneak through the jungle or sneak past them or fight them. Uh, fighting them is pretty tough, but I usually like to fight them. It's a pretty fun fight. And then after you do that, <clears throat> excuse me, you cross a couple bridges, little wooden bridges, and you are up at the the mansion area, and you can choose either to infiltrate kind of through the front, kind of up a dirt path to the right, or you can try to climb some rocks up to the left and sort of hoping to not get seen by this uh, guard with a, a spotlight sitting near there who's on 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 guard but you can kind of sneak either side on either side of the house and you got to get into the house and co talkers in the basement you meet with him and you have a whole long dialogue scene a whole whole thing happens and <clears throat> then depending on whether or not you killed all the skulls either you'll sneak back out avoiding zombie soldiers if there's any skulls left on the map or if you killed them all all what no matter what you did to soldiers beforehand uh there'll be kind of like when you pick up co a little black screen a little loading it comes back up and there'll be like pairs of soldiers patrols out in the whole region uh looking for you they're just regular dudes they're not like under control or anything and uh, you have to get out and escape them and i believe it's only when you do it that way that you actually get to see the uh, the armored vehicle that's sealing off Lufo Valley. So if you exfiltrate kind of going out the direction away from where you came in from, uh, kind of up to the north, what is that, the northeast, northwest, uh, you'll see uh, right before you get to the bridge to cross the river, there's this armored vehicle that's sitting there guarding the bridge and... Uh, I think it's a on the extreme version of the mission. It's even a red one, so it's like highly armored. It's tough to kill. You got to avoid it, because uh, one another one of your mission tasks is to extract Code Talker without him taking damage. 
And uh, but I'm pretty sure that that things that armored vehicles just not there at all if you leave the skulls alive. Uh, if you leave one of them alive, even is usually what I do, and then go back and kill the one. They'll just be stunned soldiers everywhere, and then you can just extract for free. Um, so there's a few ways to do this mission, and it, it even has kind of script stuff to, you know, uh, help you, you know, deal with those different situations so that it's not just a complete, like, uh, free run for you, you know? So it's, there's still a challenge, no matter how you do it. Um, it's kind of a tough mission. It kind of is like a double boss mission in, in, in that facing the skull snipers on them on their own is kind of hard enough, but then you've got to deal with everything from getting into the, the, the mansion, making contact with Code Talker, getting back out, and then extracting after that. It's all kind of, it's a lot for one mission. Uh, at this point in the game, if it's your first time through this mission, all, since the, the previous mission was kind of quick, and even if you kind of had to chase down the truck and get the guy after it exploded, it's still a pretty easy mission to do. This one just ra ramps the difficulty up. It's, it's a real kind of a, a wall in some senses, I think. So, I kind of call this mission the Rumble in the Jungle. Why do we call it the Rumble in the Jungle? Well, that's a reference to a fight between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman in Zaire. And I believe it was nineteen in the 1970s? Oh, I can't remember what year it was. Uh, go look it up yourself, though. There's lots of stuff to, <laughs> to learn about between that fight and this event in the game. Um... And I, I don't want to like go run through all of that because that's just that's a whole nother th whole nother deal. But <clears throat> the Foreman Ali fight was on October thirtieth. That's the important part of the date. That's why I can't remember the year. It was on October thirtieth, and I want to say it was in like seventy seventy five or seventy four, maybe seventy six. Anyways, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's not that important. Apologies for not being able to remember that, but. You take this date, October 30th, and set it to the side. Now, we know that uh, you know, October 31st is Halloween, so this is like the night before Halloween. On this mission, you can find a boombox inside the mansion that's got a tape playing in it that you can pick up, and it's one of those music tapes that's from the selected soundtrack of songs that Kojima and his team uh, curated and got picked up from the 80s, and, well... Most of them are from 1984. Most songs are from 84 or before. But there's two songs that are not. The one that I've mentioned before was The Final Countdown, released in 86. Which told us that was you know probably happening in 86. Friday I'm in Love was written in like late 1991 and didn't get recorded until I think May 1992. Or maybe early 1992, but it released in 1992. I think it was actually released in May 92. Therefore, I think that's a hint as to the time period of when this mission is taking place. It must have been after May 1992. So if you take that date, October 30th, and add that year 1992, and go look it up on Google yourself. I'm not going to do this for you, but October 30th, 1992 was a Friday. And so if Venom Snake's shown up in the jungle on... Friday, October 30th, 1992, the night before Halloween, and he sees these four snipers dressed up as as quiet, essentially, as this woman who I think he's in you know, in love with. Well, then it, Friday, I'm in love is kind of an appropriate song. And so these four snipers are like little quiet drones that they've made. Uh, they've essentially, I think, once they, in the Phantom Pain, once they had gotten, once Skullface had gotten, uh, you know, quiet and, Venom's DNA to himself, he, he basically developed his own version of the of these parasite drones. And I think that was maybe there was something that was developed before that by Big Boss. And the the sort of the evolution of those drones into the quiet uh, those quiet skull snipers and the Venom <coughs> skull armored skull soldiers, I think is kind of maybe what's going on here in the eighties and the nineties. And uh that gets into some crazy stuff, but 
essentially, I think it goes back to uh, this these child soldiers that we've been picking up the whole time. I think those are kind of like related to these drone soldiers. Um, I think that the way the that big boss was, you know, developing his parasite and was probably selling weaponized parasites, you know, soldier kits essentially. But by selling all those kits and making all these super soldiers for all these people everywhere. I think he also retained, like we hear about Skullface, he retained control of these uh, super soldiers, and so he could, I think, just give them a command and they would follow his command. And so I think that's uh, it relates to the whole drone thing going on here. And I think, uh, like I said, the, the, the four Skull Snipers are probably presented to us here in the way they are as a reference to the B&B &B Corps. Uh, that we see in Metal Gear Solid 4. I think that Skullface is probably... Oh, this is going to get into something... I talked about it in the Metal Gear Solid Delta video, if you want to go check that out. But it, I've talked about there's these two sides of the whole struggle within Cypher, the big boss side and the and the Zero side. But what we're going to have to get into is there's a third faction, actually. And I think of them as kind of the Black Ops faction. They're They're kind of the... The ones that, that fall in between, and they do all of the dirty work that can't be done by one faction or the other. And I think that eventually, by Fox's actions and his recontextualization of the mutiny via Skullface, he kind of pushed all of that stuff into the Black Ops unit, essentially. And, and sort of was able to like take some of the stuff out of the big boss side of things and shove it into this... like. This, this metaphorical black ops hole where like you know the, the intel is just it's not going to come back out it's going to stay in there right so and I think like the drone soldiers are something that that black ops unit sometimes uses um, I think that's how Ocelot gets the frog soldiers in control of them eventually in Metal Gear Solid 4 because I think this side also has roots in uh, probably Fox himself this, this third side probably resulted as an inevitable need to you know mediate the the struggle between Big Boss and Zero, and so I bet someone probably like Fox established a secret unit, and that was the one that's probably being run by Big Mama in Metal Gear Solid Four. So, with all that said, um, I think these uh, like I said the the B and B core with their armor and these four skull snipers kind of looking a little bit different with their their clothes. You could say their armor. I think that that's kind of meant to draw the connections between what's happening here and back in the past to what happened before this and then into the future with Metal Gear Solid 4. So it's kind of it's kind of serving as a bridge, you see, and that's why I think of it as this third side is I kind of think of it as bridge, the bridge kind of side. It's like they they bridge the gap that's left between the big boss and the zero factions cuz somebody's got to, right? Like it it wouldn't be possible for Cypher to just like have a schism and then just let stuff start spilling out into the world, that would be bad. So I think they have like this containment unit that sort of operates outside of, of stuff and kind of, I think that relates to the Delta symbol too. Uh, maybe what we're going to see in Metal Gear Solid 3 is what some of that, that unit did back in Salino Yarsk. So... Uh, there's your Metal Gear Solid 3. Oh, and also, this whole mission is basically a Metal Gear Solid 3 recreation in microcosm. Um, you're going into the jungle, you're going over bridges, and you're rescuing your target. Uh, this guy being in a house after you go over the bridges and him having the whole conversation with you kind of likens him to Sokolov, really, I think, primarily. And this mission primarily really stands more for Virtuous Mission than probably Snake Eater. But you could also maybe squinch the whole Snake Eater thing down into something like Virtuous Mission sized and it would probably look something kind of like this. Uh, your fight with the four Skull Snipers is kind of like your fight with the Joy. It's just happening first. So you're kind of doing it backwards a little bit. Uh, but also there is a way where you know, the, that fight kind of happens the whole time if you don't deal with them. Or even if you... Uh, you know, the, there's other ways it can go, right? Uh, there's the, the the armored vehicle or whatever. So it's, um, oh yeah, and the red of the armored vehicle. Now I'm just thinking it kind of makes me think of the Shagohod a little bit. Maybe it's a reference to that and it being on the bridge, 
with the Shago Hod being on the bridge when you blow it up with the C three and the end of Snake Eater. Maybe that maybe that's what's going on because that stone bridge is the same one that gets blown up in the prologue by Volgan's lightning. So all of these connections and remember also too how I said the Intel stuff in the air is kind of likened to bridges and you know, Intel secrets, all that kind of stuff. So uh, Code Talker is likened to Sokolov in that he's, you know, our guy that we're meeting in, in the in the place when we get across the bridge. But also, I've said in my other videos that this location kind of is likened to the training grounds and the kill house, really, in, uh, in the Peace Walker base. And how the kill house has this interior area with its, its maze-like, you know, and there's lots of targets in there. And you can kind of think of this mansion as like a multi-storied kill house. And, uh... I mean, it is literally a house, and I think of I think of PT kind of here as well. If uh, I believe if you leave the skull snipers alive, some of the radios will start playing the PT radio noises after the the transition, or maybe even before. I don't think it's before. No, it's not before because they stay in the jungle before, and then after you pick up Code Talker, they come up to the house and they enslave everybody, and then you hear the uh, the radio change. I believe. Um, but if you think of Metal Gear Solid 3 as kind of like your first Metal Gear Solid game, if, if you wanted to play it chronologically, I know I, I said all that stuff about, you know, you got to play 1, 2, 3, and blah, blah, blah. But, like, there is a good way to see it for, I guess, you know, doing Metal Gear Solid 3 first as, a, as like, a, a sort of a narrative-focused way of doing it you really probably need to play all three games first and then do this later. But if you could, if you wanted to play through Metal Gear Solid 3 first to train somebody, say if you were in the world, in the universe of Cypher, and you needed to be brought up to speed on what Big Boss's history is, you'd probably need to play Metal Gear Solid 3 first. Uh, and I had this crazy thought in the shower earlier today, too. What if Metal Gear Solid Delta is called that? Because what we're going to get to play as Metal Gear Solid Delta is the in-universe version of Metal Gear Solid 3. And they have to call it Delta because it wasn't really the third one released in, in the actual timeline. <laughs> so, you know, if this whole mission is Metal Gear Solid 3, then it's, it's kind of like you're training and you're going into the kill house and you're going to do the thing. When you go into the basement and meet with Code Talker, and talk with him. It's also likened to the part in Ground Zeroes where you've snuck into the admin sector and you've gone around in the buildings and you've gone down to the basement and you find Paws and there's a cutscene there. So your meeting Code Talker here is also like meeting Paws. So Code Talker is likened to a lot of people here. Symbolically, he kind of stands in for just a whole lot. You, I mean, I've said he's kind of Sokolov. And now he's Paws. And because he's Paws, he's also Chico. We know the, the pit, the cell, is also link, linked to Chico. And we saw back in Hellbound, Paws in the same cell as, as Huey. And we know that's linked to Zero. And Code Talker being the old man kind of likens him to Zero in my mind. So Code Talker is Sokolov. He's Zero. He's Paws. He's Chico. He's also kind of like Vulcan Raven, I think. Uh... Excuse me. I think in universe, the the character who's playing Code Talker in these events is literally the same guy who's playing Vulcan Raven in the later Shadow Moses events. And there's one more person that Code Talker is kind of likened to in Metal Gear Solid Four. You go meet Naomi Hunter. Snake goes and meets Naomi in the jung in a house in the jungle and has a conversation with her. And there's a whole deal, and it's about you know health and stuff. So. Code Talker is also Naomi Hunter. And I haven't mentioned Naomi a whole lot, or really at all, uh, because I've been kind of saving the Naomi stuff for the 80s. We're still kind of dealing with the 70s as far as the referential material goes. And we're going to get into what happens from 77 to like 84, essentially. Uh, but that's that almost requires like going back through the missions again. And I think that's kind of what happens, you know, after this. So we're going to, we're, that's what we're going to do. Um, but just to get get it out there now, in close contact, that female engineer you pick up could have been Naomi Hunter, quite literally. Um, 
if it wasn't paramedic, if it couldn't have literally been paramedic, and it definitely could have probably, I think, been Naomi Hunter. Um, and Naomi Hunter, I said in my videos, I think is Amanda Libre. I think once Amanda and Chico are picked up by Cypher, they're separated after the end of Peace Walker. Amanda goes on the land base, and Chico's on the offshore base whenever the, the mutiny happens. And so I think because of that, Amanda gets captured like immediately. And I think they've, they basically forced a new identity on her. And it was probably Emma Emmerich. She probably essentially became like Sokolov's adopted daughter. Because I think they started teaching her science stuff. I think she was pretty good at it. She just had a knack for it. So um, she was like one of their, uh, their being uh, Strange Love and Huey's adopted kids. Uh, they may have had multiple, but we know... I think that Emma Emmerich and Otacon are brother and sister. And uh, we know that Hal Otacon was born in 1980 during the whole time of MSF, it seems. Dur probably during the mutiny, still. Um, and Strangelove was, you know, obviously she must have still been Strangelove in 80. So I think this indicates that Strangelove and Sokolov were working behind the scenes for Big Boss. From the behind the scenes, of, of, from our perspective at least. Um, but they were working in the mutiny... And maybe they didn't even realize they had mutinied, but they they probably kind of did, but just justified it to themselves in in a different way. Um, you know the way that Boss gives that speech at the end of Peace Walker's second credits, the the red the red screen speech where he's saying this is outer heaven. That's a pretty it's a pretty influential speech, you know. It's it's easy to kind of think of how somebody might fall in with that kind of guy, and and have been you know after they've gone through all that and have, might have followed him into something darker, you know. So it's it's you know this whole mutiny thing. I've been kind of playing it up like they're they're awful evil villains, and yeah, they are. But there's also probably more to it than that, and we'll get to it. But that's that's probably kind of Zero's fault. Zero might have taken some of his stuff a little too far, essentially. Um, but yeah, he might have gone too far. <laughs> it's a George Lucas quote in some places. Anyways, so Code Talker is like a sandwich of all these different characters superimposed into one, one way of speaking of all of them. Um, and, the, and this whole mission is kind of like our meeting with you know, uh, Sokolov and, and we've killed the joy and done all that stuff. We met Paz. We learn about what. Is, so, what does Code Talker tell us? He, he tells us that you know these linguistic parasites are are like uh, these mating pairs, and they attach you know through the vocal cords, and once they've mated and formed their larva and sort of embedded themselves in the host, it's too late. You can't get you can't get them out. So his cure is this Wolbachia, which infects those parasites specifically and turns the female ones into male or no sorry turning male to female um so none of them can so it's all females they none of them can copulate and then that would presumably stop the uh, linguistic bug from spreading and it does but after we get them back which is after the next mission but he's got he's got this answer hidden on him, and uh, but he he gives us this whole speech really about you know we're we're wondering at this point what is activating this this parasite we don't know that it's a linguistic parasite he tells us the activation mechanism is words, and I've said earlier back in mission twenty voices how Skullface's linguistic parasite targets linguistics and language itself because he's targeting lore and this is kind of more of the same stuff uh, code talker's whole speech is really about memes and lore of metal gear and he's talking about transness i think as like you know not male to femaleness because of uh you know all this transformation stuff going on but also, like, there may literally be some some better some good reasons why he's mentioning that that are go beyond this discussion. But you know, just go back and revisit his speech and and think of uh, you know all that you know all of his his talk about words and how you could uh, 
you know, create one of these language bugs that targets just your enemy's lore, right? And you unleash it on his lands and how that's like some kind of dream of every ruler, uh, really every despot, right? But, uh, I think that relates not literally to like a, a plague, but like literally like memes, like ideas, you know, and how you can kind of control people with ideas and, and memes and things like that. And, and slick Hollywood filmmaking and good writing and storytelling and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, um, he also talks about how. You know, he he stole them away from me. Like how, how it was it was his sort of deal with the parasites were, and then Skullface stole this these secrets away from him and used him to do his terrible work. And uh, he said he couldn't resist him. There was nothing he could do, and that even a country like America sways in his wake. So America really, going back to what I've been saying, is is talking kind of about this zero faction, but it's also kind of in a more general sense referring to um, America gets later in the Skullface speech related to the it's the land of the free where a meeting of immigrants come and live alongside one another. That's really relating to Cypher itself and how, uh, how their parasite collection really, how their parasite collective really functions, <clears throat> how they're, they've all got these different kind of specializations and they don't necessarily always um, sort of homogenize themselves. It's not like a great goose scenario where everyone is just a, another part of the same constituent mass. It's like each one of them is a unique little part and has their own place and their own little story too. Um, and that's I think that's kind of a lot of this the the deeper stuff that he's talking about in this speech. But um, he also talks about how the fate of the Dene are in Skullface's hands. And I just want to note, Dene, Navajo, they are Americans. So when he's talking about the Dene and the America, he's not talking about two separate things. He's talking about the same thing, in my mind. So just keep that in mind. Like, a lot of the way he, he words his his speech here and a lot of the way his his words are ordered is kind of meant to trick you but also provide more than just a surface layer truth. It, it kind of provides you a symbolic way of understanding more truth than just the surface layer. And it's, that's why he's called Code Talker, because his whole way of talking is, is really a code. And uh, with that said, you know, there's a lot to analyze in his speech, and I could probably go on all day about it, but we got to move on. Because we also need to cover Mission 29. <laughs> um, but the last thing I want to bring up in this mission, going on around this area, is the river. Yes, it's the River of Sorrow. It's back. And it's traversing areas, and it's a, it's a tough fight here. You kind of have to stray off of the river at first to have this fight. And then you go back over it, and it kind of winds, and you go back over it again and again, maybe even a few times this mission. And again, I think that the number of times you go over the bridge kind of is a callback to Snake Eater, how many times you go over bridges in that mission. And uh, <clears throat> I think that if you take this river, it, it sort of looks like it starts in this region or maybe even further back in this region. And it's coming down waterfalls and going through this area and starting really at the kill house. So it's kind of implying that this is really where, if this is the river of sorrow, that this is the source of all of the sorrow and all of the suffering and all the, the stuff that came from it really is rooted here. So this whole idea of root cause of mission 27 pointing to mission 28 here, uh, Code Talker, I think this is all really tied in with uh, why the mutiny happened, essentially, and, and figuring out the the, uh, the cure for it, essentially, right? Because if, in a sense, if the mutiny itself is the disease, in a sense, if that linguistic parasite isn't itself the only thing that it stands for, and it's not just fox die, we've been talking about this mutiny, but then... This mutiny itself is kind of a disease, and, and Skullface is kind of, well, he's kind of going around killing it, but also curing it. Um, and I think that's that's what this river is kind of meant to kind of symbolically represent. It's, it's just sort of all of the emotion that comes out of that, uh, but mostly it's sorrow. And so this 
this river's path, if you kind of follow it and trace it, you can kind of see it as a history itself. And it's like as you go down the river further, you that fight that we did at the beginning with the, the female skull units now becomes the last thing in this region. And that means that then that that's our final boss fight. And then we move on from there to the next game, essentially. And the river goes on from there to other regions and traverses other areas and tells other stories. And I think that's kind of what's going on here. And I don't want to go into that all the way. That's something you can go explore and have fun with yourself. If I went into that all the way here, I'd kind of ruin the fun. And I don't want to do that. But trust me, it is fun. Go check it out. Okay, that's enough. Um, oh, no, one more thing. The Intel team members are buried out here. And it seems, oh, so when you when you rescue Code Talker, and you, if you take him out uh, uphill, and you're going across the last part of the river to the, like I said, to the northeast, kind of, northwest, <laughs> uh, there's a, a bunch of mounds, and it's where all the dead Intel team members are buried from... Back in Mission 27, this guy in Root Cause was an Intel team member. And uh, back in Mission 22, or I'm sorry, in another mission before this, we had to rescue Intel agents. But I think uh, this all relates back to what happened in Mission 22. When our base was invaded and we had hostages taken, when we play the mission, we can just rescue the hostages and it's Mosquito. But if this happened back in 76, let's say, to or maybe even late 75, but probably 76, to... Uh, and to Frank's Diamond Dogs, well, he pro that's probably where, when his intel, he was probably his intel strut that was invaded, and a bunch of intel was stolen, and a bunch of intel team members were probably kidnapped. And so that's probably why he's been out rescuing them all. And he maybe even uh, had to go rescue some important ones. So, so who was this code talker for Frank? Well, it's kind of hard to say. It seems like he doesn't actually pick up Sokolov here. Because it, it seems that Sokolov stays on the loose after this in uh in terms of like the, the sort of symbolic what happens after this in the in the Oh in the on the whole overarching narrative. It's that gets into a whole timeline thing, but it appears that Big Boss is not actually stopped until nineteen eighty four. And that his whole mutiny really extends for years and kind of goes on as a sort of a proxy but also kind of hot war it's like the cold war is you know it's like in the it's in its more kind of testy days right and <clears throat> in 85 in the in the timeline there was a change in soviet leadership so to speak and that soviet leadership would have been ocelot's side which would have probably been run by big boss at that point so that soviet side was probably big boss had probably hooked up with the soviet side in the past with Ocelot against Zero, and then Big Boss probably booted Ocelot out of there and kept running the Soviet side for himself. And that appears to have gone on until 1984. And then in 85, there was a new Soviet leader, Gorbachev. That's a symbol, a symbolic Gorbachev. And then a, a second detente uh, period begins, where the Cold War kind of cools back off a little bit, and eventually, you know, the Berlin Wall falls, and things get a little bit better, but... 84 was really kind of the big boiling point that led up after this. So what's happening here, if this is all happening in uh, in Rhodesia, we know that Eli, uh, Les Enfants Terribles is abandoned in 76, and we know that Eli is taken to Great Britain in 76. Well, we picked up Eli just a few missions before this in our game, so maybe that's our kind of like... Um, our sort of way of comparing Eli. Um, now, we, we also know Eli was deployed in 1991. He was sent out into the field. That's in the timeline. I don't see any way of going against that. And with this Code Talker mission taking place in 1992, that makes sense that, yeah, Eli deployed in 91, and that's when we picked him up in White Mamba. So, that kind of relates to the Eli going to Great Britain thing that we know happens in 1976. If Eli symbolically is a way of speaking of, of Chico, really, right? So maybe what happened in 76 here was they hunted down Big Boss and Chico was probably killed, but the, his he was probably not like totally like killed, killed. It was like whatever form he was in was destroyed and then he probably transformed again and his body was probably taken to Great Britain for 
like further therapy and healing and stuff like that. And we know what also happened in 76 is Zero's poison. And so Zero's poisoning probably relates to all of this stuff that I've been talking about with the, uh, well, the vocal cord parasite event and its infection on our base, probably standing in for something that happened to Frank's Diamond Dogs back in 75 and 70. Here, it was probably when it happened in 76. So we, then we know back in the future, 1993 is when South Africa acknowledges that they have nukes and they pledge to disarm. That relates to what happens in 1977 in South Africa. There was a nuke test site that was discovered under the Kalahari Desert. So that's probably a symbolic way of speaking that, co- that uh, I'm sorry, whoever Big Boss's co-talker was back then, his, his nuclear test site was discovered. And... What else happens in 77? Zero visits Big Boss and records that message, and then he vanishes. So it seems like whatever happened here back in 70s, probably 76 or 77, like late 76, maybe 77, though. Probably 77. Uh, uh, whatever happened here in Code Talker and in Metallic Archaea probably relates to this, this nuclear test site in South Africa being discovered. We know South Africa is probably related to Outer Heaven, so... Outer Heaven, wherever it was, probably in Rhodesia at this point, probably had some hidden underground nuclear test site, i.e. nuclear stuff being like they're making child super soldiers out of parasites. And so Zero visiting Big Boss kind of implies that maybe Zero was captured at this point. And him vanishing is when he gets picked up by Ishmael and he gets swept, swept away. Because it, it appears at this point, Zero had done an identity change after the 75 stuff. And he probably does another identity change at this point. So we'll get into it, but uh, this sets up stuff happening in 1979 and in 94 in the future. But that'll be for further talks in the future. we got to get to Mission 29, Metallic Archaea. Um... After we pick up Code Talker, we're talking to him in the helicopter, and a whole cloud of Archaea comes up over the, the helicopter. Now, the way this crash happens is very, very carefully scripted, and it lines up with the the crash that we haven't talked about it yet, but it's the ambulance crash at the end of the prologue. It also is the same sort of event metaphorically as the gro- the Ground Zero's chopper crash that that happens when we in in Ground Zero's right before the choppers crash. There's like this flash to white or sort of a fade to white, so we don't actually get to see the crash. Uh, but we we like I said we've sort of recreated it from a few different perspectives like in the war economy and a couple of other missions and we'll we'll recreate it again but uh essentially the meme here is that we get in a helicopter crash the pilot well the windscreen is blown out and the pilot's killed which relates to when in the prologue when the windscreen's blown out and Ishmael's knocked out after the windscreen's knocked out the whole thing crashes, and Snake and Co-Talker survive, but the pilot's gone. And Snake wakes up and gets out and observes the crash. And he pulls Co-Talker out and then has the whole fight with the Skulls. I think this is kind of like a, another one of those... It's, it's a mashup, a superimposition of all of the different helicopter crash stuff. Um, the first time I saw a helicopter crash was in Metal Gear Solid 1, when after you fight Liquid... And the hind D, it crashes, and then they're like, oh, he must have died in that crash. There's no way he'd survive. And, of course, he survives. And so that should relate, like I've been saying, if Eli is symbolically Chico and Eli is Liquid, well, then Chico survived the chopper crash because Liquid survived the chopper crash. And so that's kind of the main meme that you can take away from the Metallic Archaea mission is that Liquid survived the chopper crash. Um... It's it's a it's a also a kind of a retelling of the Vulcan Raven boss fights, especially I think the second one, the Fury kind of fight as well, because you've got these 
guys that are shooting long range bullets at you and your only real way of getting cover is behind tanks and the tanks also kind of relate to the first Vulcan or even boss fight or behind these white materials containers which kind of relate to the boxes in in a uh, in Shadow and Metal Gear Solid 1 when you fight Vulcan or even for the second time. And the way there's kind of like corridors everywhere, pseudo corridors you could say, um, kind of relates to the Fury fight. And, uh, yeah. It, it's, so it's, it's, it's showing probably what happened back in 75 after the chopper crash when I was theorizing about what happened after pause and Chico jumped out and the bomb went off and then did the chopper immediately go down you know what happened next so going back to that I think what happened is that Chico and pause jump out and then the chopper probably tries to take off and, and scoot out of there but they're probably immediately shot down uh, and I did kind of say this back then but it, it seems to be indicated that they're gunned down uh, maybe Maybe another chopper was in the sky and, and shoots them down with guns. Or maybe somebody on the ground shoots them with guns. It's kind of hard to say. Maybe an, even an anti-air emplacement with a sort of a fast-firing gun. That's more like a, a gauss, not like a exploding round thing. Anyways, chopper goes down. Snake pulls Zero out. And Zero can't walk. Probably because his legs are hurt in the crash. And then Snake has to fight a bunch of dudes. I think that's I think that's essentially what went on. Um, it's possible that they were captured back then, but you know because Ishmael seems to get captured a few times in this whole scenario. But I don't I don't really think that he got captured. I I'm gonna go I'm gonna stick with my gut and say that they probably end up you know, getting far enough away from their captors that the only people that were able to get to them were probably some kind of first strike soldiers or something like that. And Snake was probably able to fight them off and then get zero evac on another chopper. Now, we're shown in our mission, after we clear out the skulls, Ocelot comes in on the chopper and takes us out. And then we have the rest of the cutscene with Ocelot, and he tells us about, uh, or Ocelot, us, and code talker have the rest of the cutscene and he tells us about the rest of Skullface's plan and all that good stuff uh, then he gets back to base cures the you know disease and all that but Ocelot coming in and picking us up I think kind of relates to how maybe somebody else if if Snake and Zero were down there fighting and had fought off boss's guys and then kind of had a little clear space Maybe some other person, maybe some contact from this unknown third party that I've been talking about came in and got and scooped Big Boss and Zero or scooped Snake and Zero out of there and deposited them back in New York. Maybe it was someone like Eva, even. I don't know. You know, Cecile kind of seems to be on the Peace Walker base for no good reason. If if she is Eva, what's what's her mission there, you know? Uh, and Eva, you know, Big Mama later is shown as the one who's in charge of that whole Black Ops unit. So maybe it has something to do with her. Maybe she's the one flying the chopper. But I'm not sure exactly. Uh, but I think that the whole idea of Ocelot coming in and picking this up also maybe could be a hint towards it being Eva. Because they're kind of twins. So There's also another way to do this whole fight where you bring Quiet along with you. And when you bring Quiet along with you, she's also in the cutscenes. And so I think in a way that, in the same way that this tells the story of what happens to Snake and Zero after their crash, which is probably somewhere else, I think after the explosion, I think uh, Quiet and the newly made, let's call him Venom Snake, I don't know what Chico was after he first transformed, but he probably turned into some kind of a snake. So let's just call him Venom Snake. And after Chico turns into Venom Snake and Paws turns into Quiet and they land there on the ground, they've got to fight a bunch of bad dudes. Well, I think that this mission, Metallic Archaea's whole scenario, having Quiet in the chopper with you, is like another way of showing what happened to them after they jumped out. And they had to face all these really bad guys. 
And I think that maybe also relates to why Metallic Archaea happens twice. One of the reasons why we have to replay it and why it's an extreme mission the second time we do it. It's extremely difficult, you know. Uh, but the enemies have a lot more HP and, the, you know, they hit harder and stuff like that. Maybe what happened for Zero and and Ishmael over off the, on the other way was a little bit easier. And what, what, uh, what, what Quiet and Venom had to go through was a little bit tougher, you know. There's other reasons why it was a re why why the replay exists. That's not the only reason. I don't mean to make you think that, but that may be one of the reasons why. I think there's multiple reasons why we replay all the scenarios we replay, but the order in which we replay them is really the the big deal. We don't have to get to that for a few more lectures, though, so I won't. Uh, and that's all I've got about mission twenty nine. It's a retelling of the Ground Zero's crash, the two different perspectives of it, and it's a callback to all the other chopper crashes and you know chopper fights and the Vulcan Raven fight and the Fury fight and kind of the pain fight a little bit, but less so of that one. Yeah. Uh, I know that was a lot. I hope you all have enjoyed. And uh, Delta. Delta. <laughs>